Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tufts Graduate School of Arts and Sciences Graduate Student Speaker Series, or GS3. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Cecilia Inahosa from the Department of Psychology. Uh, Cecilia will be giving her presentation and will allow a few minutes at the end for questions. So, Cecilia, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you to the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences for hosting this great speaker series. So like Angela said, my name is Cecilia Hinojosa, and I am a fifth year PhD candidate in the Department of Psychology, where I work under the guidance of Dr. Lisa Shin. And in Dr. Shin's lab, we broadly focus post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD by using neuroimaging techniques such as functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. And so today I will be presenting some novel findings from a project titled Behavioral and Brain Responses to Ambiguous Stimuli in Twin Pairs Discordant for PTSD. So before jumping into the project, I want to make sure that we all know the diagnostic criteria an individual needs to meet in order to receive a PTSD diagnosis. So first, an individual needs to have been exposed to either directly or indirectly a traumatic event. And this could include having experienced actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. Next, symptoms related to experiencing the traumatic event could include re-experiencing symptoms, where the person will persistently re-experience the traumatic event via nightmares or flashbacks. There's the avoidance symptoms, where the person persistently avoids anything associated with the traumatic event, such as thoughts, feelings, or external reminders, such as people or places that were associated with the trauma. Next, there's alterations in cognitive and mood, cognitions and mood, where the person will experience negative thoughts or feelings that began or worsened after the trauma, such as an inability to experience positive affect, negative affect and having overly negative thoughts about themselves or the world. And lastly, an individual will experience hyperarousal symptoms, which could include uh, hypervigilance, exaggerated starter response, uh, difficulty concentrating, as well as difficulty sleeping. So when all individuals need to meet a certain number of these symptoms, and these symptoms need to be present for at least one month in order to meet the PTSD diagnosis. So now that we all know the diagnostic criteria of the disorder, we can discuss the underlying neurocorrelates of these symptoms. And for this talk, I will focus on two main brain regions um, that have been shown to exhibit abnormalities in the disorder. However, please know that there are more than just these two that I will not get to discuss today. So the first is the amygdala, which is in this region. It's a purple area highlighted it is a subcortical structure and it is involved in the acquisition and expression of conditioned fear and basically oversees our fight or flight response. So for example, when we encounter something that could be potentially threatening in our environment, within milliseconds, the amygdala sends projections to other regions of the brain to initiate physiological responses such as freezing, fear of potentiated startle and sweating in order to prepare us for our next move whether that be to engage in a fight or to flee a scene. So it should make sense that most of the literature exploring the amygdala and how it functions in the disorder suggests that there is exaggerated amygdala response to indicators of potential threat. So to the left is some fMRI data from Miriam el Khoury Mahami and colleagues in 2011. And this brain image was created by comparing PTSD patients to controls during the completion of a matching task using emotional facial expressions compared to matching just shapes. So the authors basically extracted the data that they found in this amygdala activation and plotted it resulting in the bar graph to the right. So from this bar graph, you can see that the PTSD patients had greater amygdala activation compared to healthy controls. The scatter plot is from the same paper where the authors also found that this same extracted amygdala activation was associated with more severe PTSD symptoms. So on the y-axis, we have PTSD symptom severity as measured by the PTSD checklist. And on the x-axis, we have that same bright amygdala activation. 
Another region that has been examined thoroughly in the disorder is the medial prefrontal cortex or the MPFC, which is in this general vicinity. Uh, and it is actually comprised of many subregions, some of which I will discuss later in the talk. One of the MPFC's jobs is to regulate and inhibit the amygdala's initiation of physiological responses to stimuli that aren't deemed threatening. So for example, let's say one day we walk into our garden, we're getting ready to water our vegetables and see something long and skinny. We might initially become startled because we are unsure exactly what that object is. It could be a twig or it could be a snake. However, upon further examination, we find out that that long skinny object was just the water hose that we're gonna actually use to water our vegetables. So it is the MPFC that collects these finer, higher order details and brings them together. And in this case, sends inhibitory signals to the amygdala to prevent the initiation of physiological responses, given that the object is not deemed to be a threat. So neuroimaging research also shows that in individuals with PTSD, the MPFC is hypoactive, meaning that it doesn't activate as best it should compared to controls. And so one study conducted in our laboratory back in 2005 compared brain activation of individuals with PTSD compared to trauma-exposed non-PTSD individuals while they viewed fearful versus happy facial expressions within the scanner. And so this image shows that a subregion of the MPFC called the rostral anterior cingulate cortex was significantly active in the trauma-exposed non-PTSD group compared to the PTSD group. That same study also found a negative correlation with the PTSD group um, in the same region, the rostral anterior cingulate cortex. So the x-axis is um, symptom severity, which is measured by the CAPS now, and the y-axis is the rostral anterior cingulate cortex activation. So there was a negative correlation, meaning that individuals with more activation in this region had lesser PTSD symptom severity. Okay, so I have presented evidence that responses to potentially threatening stimuli um, in PTSD have been well studied. However, many of the stimuli encountered from our day to day are not overtly threatening, but they can actually be ambiguous. Today, researchers have assessed the interpretation of ambiguous stimuli in PTSD using behavioral measures, but they, not have, they have not done so yet by utilizing neuroimaging techniques. And so in order to address this gap in the literature, we sought to examine both behavioral and brain responses to ambiguous stimuli in individuals with PTSD. Furthermore, one of the goals of our lab is to better understand the origin of the brain abnormalities that exist in this population. And so given this goal, our second aim for the study was to assess the origin of brain abnormalities in the disorder by using a sample of identical twin pairs discoordinate for trauma exposure. So the ambiguous stimuli we chose to use were surprise facial expressions, and that is for two main reasons. Previous research in control participants with no diagnosis of mental illness has shown that surprise expressions can be interpreted either negatively or positively, and that the valence of one's interpretation is related to the activation in amygdala and MPFC. Specifically, more negative ratings of surprise facial expressions were related to greater amygdala activation and lesser MPFC activation. And so because these findings were present in individuals who did not have any mental illness, we wanted to determine whether these findings would be exaggerated in individuals with PTSD, given what we know about the neurocircuitry of the disorder. So let's unpack this unique twin pair design. Participants in the study were male identical twins recruited from the Vietnam era twin registry and also advertisements. All but one of the twin pairs in my data set were veterans. So this schematic is a representation of that. So in total, we have four groups. First, we have a group who was exposed to trauma who ultimately was diagnosed with PTSD. And this group, will be called the EXP plus group. As you can see, there is a key on top. EX is for exposed and P plus is for having a PTSD diagnosis. Next, we have a second group that consists of individuals exposed to trauma who ultimately did not develop PTSD. So this group will be called EXP minus. EX means exposed and P minus means that they did not end up developing PTSD. 
Next, we add the co-twins of the groups to the equation. So here we have the co-twin of the PTSD patient. So we will call them UXP+, meaning that they were never exposed to trauma, so they're unexposed to trauma, but they are the co-twin of the individual who's diagnosed with PTSD. So that's why they have the P+. Lastly, we have the co-twin of the control, uh, the control pair, where we call this group UXP minus, um, because the individual is the co-twin of the um, healthy veteran who does not have a PTSD diagnosis, but they are also unexposed to trauma. Okay, great. So relative, our hypotheses were relative to the non-PTSD group, or the P minus group, the P plus group would more often misclassify surprise facial expressions as fearful, rate surprise facial expressions as being more negative in valence, rate surprise facial expressions as more arousing, and show greater amygdala responses to surprise facial expressions. We also hypothesized based on previous data in our lab that the EXP plus group or the PTSD group would exhibit relatively diminished activation in the MPFC compared to their co-twin. So how do we go about collecting these brain responses? So we do so by using fMRI. So this huge donut is a magnet powerful enough to detect the changes in magnetic properties of oxygenated to deoxygenated hemoglobin. And this change is called the BOLD signal, the blood oxygenated level dependent signal. So basically we had all participants lay down on the bed of the scanner. We put a head coil over their head to let the magnet know where we wanted its image. And where you don't see here, we usually put a mirror on top of the head coil so that individuals are able to see the images or stimuli projected on the back of the scanner. And so this is the individual preparing to enter the scanner. So when they're entered in the scanner, you really only see their feet coming out. So what did participants see in the scanner? So they saw surprise and neutral facial expressions, but for this study, uh, we used a block design in order to present these stimuli. So this means that stimuli were presented in alternating blocks. We also showed them uh, blocks of fixation, which is basically just a rest period. Um, and these fixation points lasted for 16 seconds. There was a total of four blocks of surprise facial expressions. So these are just examples of some of the images that individuals could see in this block. There's only in this example, one, block, one image presented per block, but in total, there was actually 32 images presented in each block. And we had four blocks of neutral. Again, these are just some examples of some of the images that could be seen in the blocks. But again, there was a total of 32 blocks of images per, per block, 32 images per block. So the whole task lasted around four minutes. So once participants were outside of the scanner, we had them categorize each facial expression they viewed when they were in the scanner. So we basically just gave them this image and asked them what emotion is this person experiencing? We also had them rate each facial expression seen in the scanner on valence. So how positive or negative did they find the images? And this was on a scale from negative four being very negative to a positive four being very positive and zero being neither negative nor positive. And we also had them rate how arousing the image was or emotionally provoking. So this was on a scale from one to nine, one being low arousing, nine being high and five being moderate. So here's a chart with demographic and clinical characteristics of our sample. Again, most of our exposed sample was made up of Vietnam veterans who experienced combat trauma with only one uh, pair having experienced a serious accident. So for the P plus pairs, we see that the exposed group and unexposed group contain an N of 12. And for the P minus pairs, there is um, an N of 15 in each of the subgroups. So the only significant difference between the groups was CAPS as expected. The exposed individuals with PTSD had higher CAPS or symptom, PTSD symptom severity compared to the exposed on PTSD. Okay, so the way we answer our hypotheses is by conducting mixed model ANOVAs that treat PTSD diagnosis as a between pairs fixed effect, combat exposure as a within pairs fixed effect, 
and the twin pairs is a random effect. And so I wanted to present some fake data first to illustrate the potential patterns of results that we can see from our data. So here, the y-axis is any given dependent variable that you are measuring. So in our case, we're measuring behavioral measures and we're also measuring brain activation. And on the x-axis are our groups. So one of the main effects that we could see from our data is a main effect of diagnosis. A main effect of diagnosis. This means that the abnormality is present in both the individual with PTSD and their Koch twin. So here you can see that this PTSD pairs group looks significantly different from the non-PTSD pairs group. And these findings would be consistent with a familiar vulnerability factor, meaning that the abnormality is present before the individual experienced the trauma and made the individual more vulnerable to developing PTSD after experiencing the traumatic event. Another main effect we could find is a main effect of exposure, where the exposed group presents a different pattern of results than the unexposed group on the dependent variable. So here we see that both the exposed subgroups look similarly and significantly different than the unexposed groups. And so this pattern of results would mean that the abnormality we are seeing stems from being exposed to trauma itself. Lastly, we can also find a diagnosis by exposure interaction effect where one group is significantly different on the dependent variable than the other three groups. And so here for this example, we show that the PTSD group has significantly greater uh, activation in, um, on the DVA than the other three groups. And so this uh, pattern of results would be consistent with an acquired sign of PTSD, meaning you, on you only have the abnormality if you have the PTSD diagnosis, because here we see that only the PTSD group has the abnormality. Okay, so now that I showed you some patterns that we could potentially find in our data, let's actually look at the results and see if any of those patterns become present. So if we think back to hypothesis one, it suggested that PTSD twin pairs would more often misclassify surprise facial expressions as fearful. And so we had uh, categorizations were coded as one of eight emotions, fear, happy, neutral, disgust, anger, sadness, surprise, or other. The y-axis is proportion of surprise faces categorized as fearful. Um, so basically proportions were calculated by dividing the total number of fearful categorizations by the total number of surprise faces presented. And here we can see that there is no significant effects. So there's no significant main effects of exposure or diagnosis, and there's also no significant exposure by diagnosis interaction. So we can say that our data did not support this hypothesis. Next, we have hypothesis 2A, which suggests that the PTSD twin pairs would rate surprise facial expressions as more negative in valence. So our y-axis is valence ratings from positive to negative. And so here, again, we don't really see any of those uh, patterns that I had showed previously. So there was no significant main effect of exposure, diagnosis, or interaction effects. So again, our data did not support this finding either. We also hypothesized that PTSD twin pairs would rate surprise facial expressions as more arousing. On the y-axis here, we have arousal ratings from high to low. And while we didn't find any main effect of exposure or diagnosis, we did find a main effect of emotion category, meaning that participants rated surprise facial expressions as more arousing than neutral facial expressions, regardless of what group you were in. So technically we didn't <laughs> provide evidence for this hypothesis. Okay, so now let's turn to imaging analyses. So with imaging analyses, we use what's called a subtraction method. So basically we examine how the brain responds to a certain type of stimuli compared to another type of stimuli. So in this case, to explore hypotheses three and four, our contrast of interest was surprised versus neutral facial expressions because that gives us the brain activity related to viewing the surprise emotion. However, when we ran this contrast, we actually found no significant brain activation in either of the regions that we are interested in, so the amygdala or the MPFC. So in order to better explore why that was, we also looked at brain activation related to uh, viewing surprised facial expressions versus just a, fix a fixation block. 
And so from here, we found significant amygdala activation when examining this contrast. So what we did then is we extracted the activation and then plotted it. And we found a main effective diagnosis, which basically is saying that the PTSD group, the PTSD pairs, have significantly greater left amygdala activation compared to the PTSD minus group. We also found another region of the amygdala, this time in the right hemisphere of the brain, um, to be significantly activated as well um, in the surprise versus fixation contrast. And so we plotted that and found another main effective diagnosis whereby the PTSD pair is showing um, exaggerated amygdala activation compared to the PTSD minus pair. And lastly, we found um, a region that is actually a, su a subregion of the medial prefrontal cortex, which is the medial frontal gyrus or the MFG. We found that to be significantly activated and we extracted it and plotted it and found a diagnosis by exposure interaction, which basically is showing that the PTSD individuals are showing a lesser MFG activation compared to the other three groups. Lastly, we just wanted to see the brain activation that was present in the neutral versus fixed contrast. And we also found some similar right amygdala activation. And so we extracted that and plotted it and found a main effective diagnosis similar to what was found in the surprise versus fixed contrast. So what does this all mean? So individuals with PTSD did not interpret surprised facial expressions as more negative as evidenced by our null behavioral findings. For neuroimaging data, we did not find significant activation in our regions of interest when examining the surprise versus neutral contrast. Instead, we found that P plus pairs exhibited exaggerated, exaggerated amygdala activation to both surprised and neutral facial expressions and the XP plus participants had lesser MFG um, activation in response to these prize versus fix. And so that is why when we are looking at this prize versus neutral contrast in particular that we were not finding an anything because when we were trying to do the subtraction method, it subtracted out the activation from the overlapping regions that there was activation present. Okay, so um, a mix of According to the study, amygdala activation appears to be a familiar vulnerability factor in the development of PTSD. And this is also supported by other data. However, the other data were perspective studies, not uh, twin studies. And this finding is important because it suggests that we could potentially use this region so we could measure the amygdala to screen participants or individuals who are likely to experience a trauma, such as military and police officer recruits, to determine who might be most at risk for developing the disorder. So maybe we can prevent them from developing PTSD. Lastly, we saw that hypoactivation of the MPFC is in um, only individuals with PTSD. So this suggests it's a acquired characteristic of the disorder. And again, previous studies have shown similar results, uh, including other twin studies. And this is important as we can potentially develop early interventions such as pharmacological treatments to ensure that the MPFC is strengthened directly after trauma is exposed. So maybe in the future when individuals come and say, come to the ER and say that they've experienced a trauma, um, we can see whether or not they or provide them with um, some pharmacological treatment to ensure that they don't develop PTSD after experiencing the trauma. And this region could also be a potential biological marker for symptomatic improvement. So we can measure this, determine whether or not an individual uh, recovers from a particular treatment. So I'd like to thank my, fun my funding mechanism, the Ford Foundation, and all the other funding mechanisms that supported this project. Thank you. And my lab, of course, and the participants. Thank you. Do we have any questions? So uh, have, have there been previous twin studies 
looking at these kinds of 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 issues, um, right? Because it seems as if you know you you found potentially families that are reacting more to just faces more than some other other individuals. Is that a pattern that people have seen before? So there's been a couple of twin studies um, from our group, and there's also been twin studies that have looked at structure. So our group had looked at another, um, we used another paradigm called script driven imagery, where we basically have participants talk about their trauma and also present them with a neutral script. And so we wanted to see the differences in brain activation between those um, different kind of stimuli given to them. And so that was the Dahlgren study uh, that found a similar um, effect or interaction. Mm -hmm. where the RACC was um, an acquired characteristic of PTSD. So that is another a functional study, but there's also been structural studies that have looked at the hippocampus, which is also a brain region that's affected in individuals with PTSD, um, that has shown that maybe having smaller hippocampal volumes is a, a risk factor for developing the disorder after experiencing a trauma. And then one other uh, twin study that I know of is also one that's looking at function or structure in the rostral anterior cingulate cortex. So there isn't much, but we have much more data also to analyze too on our end. And then the other thing I noticed uh, uh, it was that your sample is, is um, well, they're older than you. How about that? Uh, <laughs> we'll say that. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Because I don't, I refuse to say they're old. Uh, <laughs> but but clearly, the, you know, if it, they're Vietnam era veterans, their trauma probably happened some some time ago. Mm -hmm. Is there? I'm just curious. I know your study wasn't addressing this, so this is just a right. question of of, of 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 gaining some information. Is there any is there any trajectory to PTSD? Do people just you know have something traumatic in their 20s or or something that can last all the way into their 60s? And is there any modification or treatment that's effective here? Well, that's definitely the case for some people where um, individuals will have experienced a trauma very young and still have PTSD um, because of that trauma, even when they're older. Um, and in that case, I would hope that they would at least explore some treatment options because there are treatment options out there um, some of which are psychotherapy, which I'm like an advocate for because it's really just talk therapy. So basically mm -hmm. some treatments called cognitive behavioral therapies have the individual talk about their trauma and overcome some of the um, memories that they have. Um, because a lot of the times, like I discussed, uh, the PTSD symptoms is avoidance. So they like to avoid anything related to the traumatic events. And so with talk therapy and psychotherapies, it's more like talking about the trauma. Um, but there is also some PT a PTSD called delayed onset PTSD that I don't study, um, but it could be the case where you experience a trauma and then don't go on to um, exhibit symptoms of the traumatic event until years later. Mm. So it depends, it's very individualistic. Sessie, what's the most common trajectory after an experience of trauma? So usually people overcome the trauma. So they usually are resilient to it, but there's very few, a small percentage who are not. And that's really one of the questions we're asking is why is it that subset of individuals who go on to develop the disorder? So around 90% of individuals may experience traumatic events in their lifetimes, but only around 6.8% of us will go on to develop the disorder. I had a question, if, that, sure. if that's okay, if it's permitted, if Sassy will permit. <laughs> We've talked about these data for so long. So, um, but when, you know, it struck me when I was looking at your graphs, right, of the mm -hmm. main effective diagnosis where we saw in the PTSD pairs amygdala activation that was, you know, um, in the positive direction and in right. the, the PTSD negative pairs, the control pairs, we saw the bars going down in the negative direction. And yes, certainly there's a group difference, but what's interesting, right, is the fact that the, the unusual ones are, are the controls actually. They're actually mm -hmm. showing less activation in the amygdala. Mm 
I just was thinking, what are your thoughts about that? Why are these control pairs not responding in the amygdala at all when you might think they'd respond just a little, but they're actually going down. In those that's things. a, yeah, that's a great question. So one way I guess we can go about like thinking about this is there could, they could be responding to these stimuli. However, we are measuring the stimuli across a certain amount of time. And so we know that the amygdala habituates across time. And so it could be that their amygdala is actually habituating to the stimuli. So in order to directly answer that, we could split up the blocks. So have the first presentation of like three blocks and then the last presentation of three blocks and see whether or not there's a difference in amygdala activation between early and late presentation of blocks. That's definitely one thing we could do. Yeah, <laughs> add, that, add that to your list of, of many <laughs> things um, to do. Yeah. I guess the other there's another possibility too, right? Is that they may just that may be some type of resilience or protective factor. Mm -hmm. Definitely, that's a characteristic of 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 those folks who, yes. you know, in the case of the twin who went to combat, right? There may be something, some resilience factor about that person who went to combat and never developed PTSD. Mm -hmm and that their brother or identical co-twin has that too. Right, uh, yeah. So that's another way to think about it. Resilience as opposed to risk. Yep. But great job. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions or? Oh, just one observation. <laughs> that is, you showed me one, your first graph, you showed me a big main effect, and then you told me there was no main effect. And uh, to which I, I, all I could say is, well, you need to collect more data because it was hard to believe oh, there right, was no, right. no effect there. <laughs> I see, which for the behavioral? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it was the very first one where yeah. you know, the stats are saying there's no yeah. main effect, but my eyes and the patterns yeah. just, you know, just yeah. say, cry, we it, probably you should look more, get more data. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always a problem for us. Always a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Even we had more identical twins I know. Lived in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, no, no. No, we hear, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. You're looking at, a, you're looking at, a, you're slicing the population pretty thin at, at yeah. that point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great stuff. Thank you.